Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining the brunch just the, the day after the, the, the autumn budget. My name is Ian Holloway and I'm a payroll consultant, I realise. And as I said last month and what I've been preparing for, <coughs> oh, excuse me, is to talk about the autumn budget uh, 2021, which was yesterday presented by the Chancellor of the Exchequer. When I was listening to him, when I was going through all of the supporting documentation, I thought, you know, I must have missed something because this just doesn't seem very exciting at all. And I had to actually phone a colleague and I said, have I missed anything? Because there's nothing in there for, well, nothing substantial in there for payroll. And uh, she said to me, no, 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 there wasn't anything substantial. However, when you look at the autumn budget 2021, you've also got to look back to the announcements that were made at the spring budget 2021. So that was in March, 3rd of March. And you have to look at the announcements that were made on the 7th of September. So what I'm going to be doing as I go through here is I'm going to talk about the autumn budget when a statement was made in the autumn budget. But if it was a statement made in the spring budget that affects us maybe for next year or future years, I'm going to talk about the spring budget and also the announcements on the 7th of September. Now, what I wanted to do was to point you to the mass of reading material that's out there. Um, would I recommend that you take this to bed? Probably not, because it's ever so boring. But um, if you really want an in-depth look at, at what the budget has to say, have a look at the, uh, the red, what they call the red book. Make sure when you Google the red book or however you search for the red book, make sure you look for the budget statement, a stronger economy for the British people, because that was the one that was yesterday. What you also need to look for is the results of the, the policy and costing announcements. And that's the link there. So you might want to, to put in your search en engine autumn budget and spending review 2021. So that shows you how each of the policies has been costed. That's an interesting document as well. And this is a good document for payroll and reward professionals, the OOTLA. And the OOTLA is the overview of taxation legislation and rates. So that's quite a good document, the OOTLA. So I'm going to, when something's come out as a result of what's in the OOTLA, I'm going to say that. And another one um, that completes the budget, budget picture is the Blue Book. Now that is due out tomorrow um, from the Office of National Statistics. So it's just another way of presenting the information that we've already got as a result of the spending review and in the red book, but it's a statistical representation. So we don't know everything about the budget completely until we've got all of those documents and the blue book is not due out until tomorrow. Okay, so let's have a look at um, the budget and uh, whether or not it was the autumn budget, the spring budget, or as a result of the OOTLA. So I want to talk about the budget themes, that's in the spending review document, co what he said about COVID-19, and then of course what he said about income tax, national insurance, the national minimum, living wage, apprenticeships, pensions, and um, oh, you know me, I just waffle on, and I'm sure there'll be other bits and pieces um, as we go through. So the themes, as I said, this is in the spending review document. And the first theme was um, all to do with um, uh, levelling up. And the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and Ministers have definitely said that is their intention to level up, to make sure that the South East is not treated more favourably than the North West and North East and, and that kind of thing. Or indeed, Wales is treated less preferably than England. And if you look at the budget red book, um, which I did yesterday afternoon and yesterday evening, there's 92 mentions of the phrase levelling up. So this is quite a serious government intention. The next uh, theme of the budget was the move towards net zero. Uh, 54 times that, that phrase was mentioned in the Red Book, and that's really important given that the budget was... Uh, a few days away from the start of this COP26, which takes place in, in Glasgow next, uh, next week. Another theme was to do with education, jobs and skills. Then we looked at health and then we looked at crime and justice. And that was where I got really excited. Uh, when I saw the themes, I thought this is really exciting because education, jobs, skills, health, crime, justice are all devolved issues. 
So Wales can do what they like. Wales doesn't have to do the same as England frequently. It does, but it doesn't have to. Scotland does its own thing and Northern Ireland does its own thing as well. So what you really have to do when you look at a budget statement, when you look at any announcement by any minister, in fact, you have to consider, well, does that just apply in England or is actually that a devolved responsibility? And living in one of the devolved nations uh, myself, I know that I perhaps don't always listen to what Boris Johnson says because he speaks on behalf of England. I listen to our first minister. I don't li listen to what the education secretary says because he speaks for England. We've got our own education secretary. We've got our own health minister. Uh, we've got our own national health service because we don't rely on national health, uh, national health uh, uh, NHS England. We've got big Cymru. Um, in Wales. So that I thought was really interesting and, and it really, and the whole um, COVID-19 pandemic has really thrown up the, the fact that um, uh, Westminster talks as if they're talking for the whole of the United Kingdom, but they can't because of devolution. Now, if you're gonna read the Red Book, there's a couple of things that you'll, you'll see mentioned. Uh, the, the terminology DAs. If you see DAs, what that means is devolved administrations. And you'll also see the terminology, the block grant. Now, what the, the budget will do is it will make uh, policy announcement, uh, announcements. Now, where it recognises that that policy announcement is only for England, what it will do is it will say, well, uh, we're, we're putting in place this policy for England. However, we need to give an equivalent amount to Wales, the DAs to Wales, to Scotland and to Northern Ireland. And the block grant you might see also referenced um, the Barnet form formula. Now, the, the block grant is calculated as per this Barnet formula, which is essential. A, a lot of the time looks at the population in England compared to the population in Wales, compared to the population in Scotland. Very, very roughly, that's how the block grant is allocated. I think it's also worth saying that there are other budgets. This was the UK budget, but there are other budgets that we really, as payroll and reward professionals, should be looking at. We've got the Scottish, Scottish budget to look for, and that's really important because uh, uh, income tax is significantly shared uh, with Scotland. And we've got Kate Forbes delivering the Scottish budget on the 9th of December. Should be an easy passage uh, this time because the Scottish National Party have got politically into bed with the Scottish Greens. So what comes out of her mouth on the 9th, you can be pretty sure is what's going to happen. The Welsh budget, possibly a different kettle of fish. That is uh, Rebecca Evans uh, does the Welsh budget in the Senate on the 20th of December. Welsh Labour are the governing party here, but they don't have a majority. There are talks about going in with Plaid Cymru, but that doesn't seem to have come to anything yet. So we're looking at the UK budget, but what comes out of the mouth of ministers regarding the UK budget doesn't necessarily apply UK wide. And that's very, very important. So looking at um, the, the, what the budget said, it talked about coronavirus jobs, uh, uh, coronavirus support schemes. They were talking about the job retention, the SSP scheme, that kind of thing. But I'm sure that you all know the coronavirus job retention scheme ended on the 30th of September. You should have got your claims in. If you had any amendments to those claims, you've got until tomorrow to make those amendments. Now, what the budget said um, re regarding the coronavirus job uh, support schemes, the various support schemes that were uh, out there for a considerable period of time, is that it provided, the UK government provided £378 billion pounds worth of direct support. So it's not just the job retention, it's the SSP, the self-employed as well. Now, um, what's going to happen is that they're looking at whether or not that, that money was allocated correctly. Now, in the spring budget in March 2021, the, the Chancellor announced the setting up of this Taxpayer Protection Task Force. They wanted to make sure that the, the monies that had been claimed and the monies that had been allocated hadn't been allocated incorrectly or fraudulently claimed. So they were given 100 million to HMRC to set up this taxpayer protection task force, protecting us, the taxpayer, from fraud or, or maladministration, misadministration. 
what the autumn budget said was um, we're going to allocate another 55 million pounds to this taxpayer protection task force at HMRC. And what that says to me is that HMRC have definitely got a focus on compliance or non-compliance with the various coronavirus support schemes that are available. So be aware of that. And you've got to keep record. It's for six years, isn't it? So that's an extraordinarily long time. You've got to keep records. But HMRC have definitely got to focus on compliance. The UK government have paid out an awful lot of money. They want to make sure that that money was not um, uh, malappropriated. OK, with regards to income tax, for next year and subsequent years, the March 2021 budget froze for five years, the personal allowance and therefore the marriage allowance would be frozen as well. It froze the basic rate limit, so the amount of net taxable income at which you pay tax at the basic rate, so it froze that. And therefore, the higher rate threshold is frozen. The higher rate threshold is calculated by adding the value of the personal allowance to the basic rate limit. So you will pay um, uh, tax at the higher rate once your income exceeds the higher rate thresholds. And I spoke at the time about the impacts of the uh, freezing of the higher rate threshold and the basic rate and the personal allowance. And simply, more people are going to be bought into the tax system. And there's going to be, as, as salaries increase, more people are going to be pay, paying tax at the higher rate. And of course, as salaries increase, more people are going to be losing their personal allowance as well. So when you hear commentators on the, on the, on the television talking about tax rises, this isn't an actual tax rise. But when if you look at inflation and you look at uh, wage growth, in actual fact, this is a tax rise because we, we would have expected those basic rate limits and those marriage allowances and those personal allowances to have increased along with uh, consumer prices index, but they're not. They're frozen until April 2026. However, the blind person's allowance and the married couple's allowance, so this is for if, if there's any people on the payroll, uh, the couple but in the 1930s, they would have been married they will increase by the value of consumer prices index. And the legislation says you inflate it based on the consumer prices index as at September, which was 3.1%. Now, the UTLA uh, details those. So that's the um, overview of taxation, legislation and rates. It details the married couple's allowance. It details the blind person's allowance for 2022-23, and also for good measure, I've stuck in there uh, information about the personal savings allowance for basic rate and higher rate taxpayers. I'm not going to go through all of that um, uh, information, but it will be available on the slides afterwards. With regards to income tax on dividend payments, we have to look at the announcement on the 7th of September 2021, which was all to do with the introduction of the health and social care levy, which, depending on the commentary you hear, either comes into force next year or it comes into force the year after. I believe it comes into force the year after, in actual fact. The auto, what the autumn budget confirmed is that the dividend uh, threshold had been uh, frozen at £2,000. Therefore, ne therefore, from next year, those are the rates that are payable at the basic, the higher and the additional compared to 21, 22. And I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read through them. But essentially, each of those in 2021, 22 has been in inflated to take into account this health and social care uh, levy 1.25%. With regards to other bits and pieces um, with regards to taxation, uh, have a look. If this affects you, and I'm not going to, de go into detail because it doesn't affect anybody, everybody, have a look at basis period reforms. And this largely applies to sole traders and partnerships. And from tax year 24, 25, what the profits of the business will be, uh, 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 how they'll be taxed, is based on a tax year rather than a company's, a sole trader's accounting year. They might have an accounting year from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. Um, that's how they're currently taxed. From 2024-25, they will be taxed as per the tax year. 
So companies, sole traders, partnerships, et cetera, might want to look at moving their accounting year, um, but that's, that's a personal decision. This is another one as well, and it's quite obvious that this is what HMRC are, 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 are focusing on, non-compliance and the promoters of tax avoidance. So have a look at the finance bill and the draft legislation for that is out. If you have a look on gov.uk on the budget documents, um, the draft clauses are there. And a couple of things, or three new, the three things that it can actually do, um, HMRC can freeze if they identify a promoter of tax, of, of tax avoidance, they can freeze their assets. There's gonna be a new penalty regime um, in, uh, in place, and there's going to be a sharing of information. Now, the sharing of information, I assume it's going to be a naming and shaming things, uh, uh, regime, much like uh, payment of the national minimum wage. With regards to national insurance, I flicked on a bit early there, with regards to national insurance, the March 2021 budget confirmed that the upper earnings limit would be frozen until April 2026. So for the next few tax year, the upper tax years, the upper earnings limit is frozen. And the upper earnings limit is and will remain aligned to the upper secondary threshold. threshold so that's for the under 21s, the apprentice upper secondary threshold. So that's for and uh, uh, apprentices of under 25 studying a, a recognized uh, apprenticeship, or the veterans upper secondary threshold, the VAST, which um, is enforced from April 2021. So all of those have been frozen until April 2026. What the March 2021 budget said, well, we recognize that there's other national insurance thresholds and we'll consider in, in incrementing those legislation does say that they'll be incremented and that legislation can be easily overwritten. So uh, what the March budget said, well, definitely we'll freeze the upper earnings limit and the ones that are aligned to it, but we'll consider the other ones, the lower earnings limit, the primary threshold, the secondary threshold. The UTLA, which came out yesterday, confirmed the weekly um, lower, primary, secondary, and also the free uh, the free port as well, um, which is a new one from 2022, April 2022. Now, what we've got to look for, I appreciate not everybody is weekly paid. The only one of those thresholds that really sticks in my head is the lower earnings limit on a weekly, because that's so important for qualifying for things like statutory sick pay, statutory maternity pay. So I remember the 123. I don't remember any of the others, um, to be quite honest. But what's important for software developers is those uh, lower earnings limit, primary, secondary, on a per pay period basis. They haven't been issued as far as I'm aware yet. They will come out from um, HMRC imminently, Im imminently. I was made aware of them from a colleague this morning, but I like to hear it from HMRC's mouth rather than someone else's mouth. So look out for those because they haven't been announced yet. With regards to this vast veterans upper secondary threshold, this is effective 21-22 for, for um, ex-armed forces veterans who enter civilian employment for the first time. And it's a, 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 a hol national insurance holiday, if you like, for the first 12 months in civilian employment. It does apply from 21-22, but it's not going to be facilitated in the payroll until 22-23 at which point veterans in civilian employment for the first time will be allocated national insurance letter V. And if there's um, a, a veteran that might be on another letter, a deferred letter, a, 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 married, a married woman's letter, a widow's letter, um, that's unfortunate because there's just one letter for the veterans because HMRC say they don't anticipate there'll be many other um, kinds and they don't anticipate there'll be many other veterans entering mariner employment as well. What HMRC, so this is not the 7th of September, this is not the spring budget, and this is not the autumn budget, but this is HMRC saying, well, we recognise that the VAST was effective 21-22, so effective 6th of April 20, 2021. So employers might actually have in their employment a veteran entering civilian employment for the first time. 
However, they can't facilitate that in payroll because it's not going to be in payroll until 2022, 23. So what HMRC said to software developers is that um, employers might want to use this fast in the current tax year. Two ways of doing it. They can either reclaim via your software from the start of the next tax year. And what that will mean for software developers and what that will mean for employers is going back and looking at all of your veterans in each pay period, recalculating each pay period, looking at the national insurance that was paid, comparing it to the national insurance that should have been paid. So that's one way it can be reclaimed or employers can enjoy this national insurance holiday or another way is to manually write a letter to HMRC saying, I employed a veteran for this period of time for, these, uh, for uh, uh, earning this amount of money and I want my money back. I've talked to a couple of software developers and the couple that I've spoken to say, why would we do it in uh, software? Uh, we don't have that many employers that are going to be employing uh, um, ex-armed armed forces, veterans in civilian employment. Why on earth would we go through that palaver when the employer can just actually write a letter to HMRC? So if that does apply to you, I would ask you to check your with your software developer. Are they going to be facilitating a reclaim via software? Yes, that would be interesting. If it applies to you, I would ask your software developer. Okay, moving on to the hope, um, uh, health and social care levy, and it's and I have shown this slide before, and it's worthwhile mentioning again what the manifesto commitment said, the Conservative Party manifesto, we will not raise the rate of income tax, value added tax, or national insurance. Then came the 7th of September, and there's the policy paper on the health and social care levy, which is on gov.uk. This said, um, from 2022-23, there will be an increase in national insurance and dividend tax NI percentages. So that immediately broke the Conservative Party manifesto pledge. And right at the bottom there, it says to fund the NHS. And if you look at the policy paper, that is what the increase in dividend tax and national insurance will do in 2022-23. It will fund the NHS to enable the NHS to get uh, cope better with perhaps the backlog that's that's um, uh, come about as a result of the, the pandemic. Initially, when the policy came out, it said that it would apply to class one national insurance. It applies to class one, E and E. <coughs> Excuse me. It also applies to 1A, 1B and class four. So it doesn't apply to class two, self-employed, and it doesn't apply to class three, the voluntary national insurance. From 2023-24, that is when the health and social care levy at 1.25% will actually become live in payroll systems. So HMRC can't accommodate it at the moment. Software developers won't be able to accommodate it at the moment. It's far too late for software developers to, to be able to accommodate it. So they're waiting until 23-24. It's at that point that the health and social care levy will become a separate uh, statutory deduction, require a separate payslip entry. 1.25 will be deducted and national insurance percentages which are increased next tax year will decrease in 23-24. Now this health and social care levy is all designed to pay for health and social care in England because health and social care is a devolved responsibility so Wales can do what they like, Scotland can do and Northern Ireland can do what they like. So the um, uh, lookout for increased amounts in the block grant um, uh, in respect of uh, health and social care that uh, uh, applied in England, and a portion should go to Wales, a portion should go to Scotland. Now, when that portion goes to Scotland via the block grant, and it goes to Wales, and it goes to Northern Ireland, the devolved nations don't actually have to use it for health and social care, uh, because they can choose to, to do what they like. OK, so the national insurance uh, percentage increases that apply for next year are shown on the slide there. And importantly, they will not apply to anybody on category letter C. So that's your people that are over state pension age, apply to every other letter. 
capacitors. I'm not going to talk about uh, those that are shown. But what I will, will say is that the secondary thresholds will remain in place. So that's your upper, your uh, apprentice um, uh, secondary threshold, your freehold upper secondary threshold, and your veterans upper secondary threshold. The employment allowance will uh, remain available. And if you look at the UTLA, which came out yesterday, that confirms that that has been frozen for 22-23 at £4,000. And what HMRC of cheekily requested software developers do is to explain away the national insurance increases on payslips from next year. They've asked software developers if they will um, uh, facilitate a standard payslip message which will be something like uh, your national insurance has gone up because the government have imposed a health and social care levy. Um, they haven't increased national insurance, but this is the way that they're, they're, they're collecting it for 22-23. Haven't seen the wording of that standard payslip message yet, but I would uh, query with your software provider because not all software providers actually um, can facilitate printing a payslip message and maybe employers use the payslip message for something else. Happy birthday, congratulations on reaching 55, congratulations on your wedding, that kind of thing. Um, so check with your software developer because that's what HMRC have requested. They've requested a standard payslip message cheaply. Okay, national living wage, national minimum wage, big in the news, uh, 25th of October. Uh, Her Majesty's Treasury came out and they said we'd accepted the recommendations of the Low Pay Commission. That's what LPC stands for. And Autumn Budget 2021 confirmed that. So those are the new rates from uh, next year. And they are effective, not exactly on the 1st of April, but for the first full pay reference period that starts on or after the 1st of April. I see this every year, to be quite honest. If you've got if you've got a monthly payroll, it's quite like, and someone's on the national minimum wage, it's quite likely that their pay reference period will run from the 1st to the 30th of um, April. If you've got somebody on a weekly payroll, it's quite likely that that week will cross the 1st of April. So there's no statutory liability to pay the national pay at the national minimum or the national living wage until the start of the first full pay reference period on or after the first. You will hear on the news in, in, in the months to come, national minimum wages are going up on the 1st of April. That's not strictly true. It isn't strictly true. But there's nothing to say you can't change them on the 1st of April. I haven't put the accommodation offset on that. That's gone up as well. And that was in the UTLA as well. So if the accommodation offset applies, have a look in the UTLA on the reference. I'll try and put it on the slides when these slides come out to you. With regards to apprenticeships, OK, what the um, a very big the government is on um, high wages, high skills. That's what uh, the current prime minister has been saying. That's what the current chancellor of the exchequer have been saying. We believe in a high skills, high wage um, uh, workforce. So one of the ways that they're supporting this high skills is uh, promoting apprenticeships. But we are looking at the promotion of apprenticeships under the English regime, which uses the standards regime. The uh, apprenticeships in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are either under standards or frameworks, largely frameworks. So we're looking at all of the points there are looking at the apprenticeship regime in England. So they're going to increase funding, presumably to the Institute for Apprentices, Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Great. They've committed to maintain this co-investment or co-funding, also great. Not all employers pay the apprenticeship levy. So not all employers are able to draw down on their apprenticeship levy funds to pay for an apprentice going through training. So what the government have said is that uh, one way that a small employer can uh, uh, utilise an English apprenticeship standard is by going into co-investment uh, co or co-funding. Employer, you pay 5%, government pays 95%. I think that's absolutely great. They're looking at for small, employ, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, this enhanced recruitment service to make it easier to recruit an apprentice. That's going to be by May next year. 
the support payments that are currently available, they're looking at those and they're looking at rather than going, going to an apprenticeship training provider, they're looking at the support payment going directly to the employer. Look out for that if that applies. And this will be interesting, I think, as well, this return on investment tool. And that will be a tool, and I can't imagine what it's going to look like, but um, it's going to be a tool essentially so that the employer can look and see whether or not putting the apprentice through an apprenticeship was worthwhile, whether or not they are getting a return on their investment. So that was the announcement about apprenticeships. With regards to pensions, lifetime allowance was frozen. That was announced at the March budget. So for next year and until April 2026, the lifetime allowance remains frozen at its 2020. When was that level? Was it this year it came in? Anyway, it remains frozen at £1,073,100, the maximum amount that can be saved with tax relief into a pension fund. So that remains frozen. The UTLA confirmed that the annual allowance is frozen as well at £40,000. The tapered annual allowance is £4,000. Uh, that's when somebody earns over a certain amount of adjusted income. And the money purchase annual allowance is frozen at £4,000. The money purchase annual allowance uh, applies to someone who's flexibly accessed their pension funds. So those are frozen. Other bits and pieces I'm sure that you'll have seen on the news um, and uh, all, the, all the palaver about uh, the uh, uh, triple lock, which the Conservative uh, Party, now government, uh, said that they would maintain. On the 7th of September, the same day as the announcement for their health and social care levy, they said, actually, we can't afford the triple lock, because the triple lock was either 2.5%, uh, 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 the consumer prices um, index inflation or the rate of average earnings. Well, the rate of average earnings growth was scheduled to be possibly up to 8%. And the government said, well, we can't afford that. So for next year, for pensioners in receipt of either the basic or the new state pension, the double lock will replace the triple lock. And the double lock is looking at the higher of consumer prices uh, index inflation at September, which was 3.1% or 2.5%. So it's 3.1%, the increases to the B BSP and the NSP. With regards to tax relief, this is interesting as well. Have a look at this, particularly relevant for low earners. And this was announced at Autumn Budget 2021. Two ways that an employee can get tax relief, either via the net pay arrangement, where essentially the, the, the pension contributions come off of taxable pay before tax is calculated, or relief at source, where tax relief is given at the basic rate claimed either by the pension scheme or frequently the basic rate relief is given in the payroll. Oh, I've got a, a bullet point out of, out of sync there. Now, what happens that the, the anomaly that's been going on for years and years and years is that low earners that are in a net pay arrangement scheme do not get tax relief because they don't pay tax. So if you're earning under £12,570, you're not going to pay tax. So your taxable pay might be reduced, but that's regardless, you're not getting a tax relief, which you're actually due. So what Autumn Budget uh, 2021 said was that from 2024-25, which can be claimed from 2025, these low earners, that are not getting tax relief, but should be getting tax relief in a net pay arrangement scheme, can apply for a top up, which will be worth up to, I think the red book said 53 pounds. I calculated more than 53 pounds, but they said it'd be up to 53, an average of 53 pounds. Look out for that if that applies. Um, something else to be aware of, um, the currently you can act flexibly access your pension funds as a result of the pension flexibilities that were announced uh, years ago um, from the age of 55. 
20th of July said the government is going to go ahead and from April 2028 increase that age 55 to 57. And the reason it's going up to 57 is it's going to be 10 years earlier than the state pension age. Fuel benefit. Oh, I can't talk excitedly about the fuel benefit. There it is for 22-23. Look at the UCLA. Can't talk excitedly about this either. Look at the UTLA. Yes, that's interesting as well. And I and I I, I haven't seen any, any any further information about that because um, th that particular point there, two point one zero eight, said that there will be additional funding which employers and fleet managers are possibly going to require, which will support the um, uh, government proposals to end the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2030. Look out for that if that applies. I haven't seen anything. Another one that he ended his rabbit out of the hat, uh, not hatch, the rabbit out of the hat uh, thing. Um, he withdrew the 20, or the UK government withdrew the 20 pounds universal credit uh, top up. And so there was big calls for them to either reinstate that or do something else with universal credit. And he chose to do it via the universal credit taper. Now, does this affect payroll? Not directly. However, we should be aware of two things. Firstly, anything that we send via RTI to HMRC supports the, the running of universal credit. And we don't know which employees in our workplace are in receipt of universal credit. So in actual fact, we should know about these things. And definitely we should be aware that everything that we send to, our, uh, to um, HMRC on the full payment submission supports someone who might be in receipt of the universal credit. What happens at the moment is if someone were, um, is earning above their work allowance, the universal credit payment is tapered and it's tapered by 63 pence in the pound. Um, so for every pound you earn over the work allowance, and there are different work allowances depending on your circumstances, and we're not going to know the work allowances that apply to our employees, uh, but for every pound over the work allowance that applies to that employee, 63 pence, every pound earned, 63 pence is, lo pence is lost. What the Chancellor has said is that by the 1st of December 2021, so legislation has got to go through, I've no doubt that the legislation will pass, but that, that taper will be reduced from 63 pence in the pound to 55 pence in the pound, so from 63% to 50, uh, 55%. And that was big news uh, yesterday, and the Chancellor always leaves happy jolly things right until the, the, the last minute. And that was how he closed his speech yesterday. Now, with regards to starting the next tax year, uh, we're still waiting on a few things. Details about the apprenticeship levy, you know, the apprenticeship levy allowance, the 15,000 and the rate, the 0.5%. I couldn't see any mention of that in the UTLA. And I looked again this morning, I dreamt about it last night, but I'm really sad. Um, couldn't see anything. Um, so we need that confirmed. The thresholds, as I said before, on a per pay period basis, I'm expecting HMRC to advise software developers any day now, uh, to be quite honest. They have advised a colleague, but I want to see it from HMRC. The AE thresholds from the pension regulator, um, they are uh, reviewed every year. So that's your qualified earnings band, lower and higher, and your earnings trigger. I assume that the lower QEB and the higher QEB will remain aligned with national insurance contributions. And I assume that the earnings trigger will remain at £10,000. I don't know, but we're waiting for that. Now the budget is out of the way. Maybe we'll get something, excuse me, from the TPR. Student loans, this is interesting as well. We're waiting for the plan two annual threshold. We've got the plan one annual threshold. And I was, and I did a lot of work actually looking yesterday at what he was gonna do about student loans because there was a lot of speculation that he would implement the, the, uh, some of the findings of the 2018 uh, post, uh, 2018, what was it, post, 
post-18 education review. I think it's called the AUGER review, A-U-G-E-R, if you Google that. And what this uh, uh, guy said in this review was basically um, uh, students, when they come out, should uh, not have their loans written off as early, so they should pay it for as long as possible, and the thresholds should not be so high, so they should start repaying their student loans um, earlier. Nothing was announced about Plan 2, and I thought something's going to be announced in the budget, but it wasn't announced in the budget, so presumably that's not happening, but do look at the AUGA review because that's what he recommended, um, yesterday wasn't a bad news day. March was the bad news day. Um, um, have a look out for this auger review. So we're still waiting for the plan two annual threshold. I could calculate that if um, HMRC have problems. And we're, then we're looking for the plan one and plan two per pay period thresholds. We're also looking, of course, for postgraduate and uh, plan four thresholds, but I don't believe that there's anything in legislation that says that those will be incremented from the current 21 and 25,000. We're waiting for those. Statutory payments, they must come out any day. They must come out uh, any day. Again, I could probably calculate those if anybody uh, wants me to calculate them because they will increase by the rate of consumer prices index as at um, September. Oh my word, gosh. Claude, you didn't drop off. <laughs> You're quite right, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> that, was, that was marvelous, Ian, as always. Um, now, we have had, uh, first of all, rather than a question, I just wanted to say that very kindly, Steve Herbert uh, checked and said that the pensions lifetime allowance frozen was at 2021 weight rates, 2020, 2021 rates. Thank you. So, I thought it was. I thought it was because everything else went up. Everything else, like the personal allowance wasn't frozen at 2021. It was um, uh, it was incremented last year, but the lifetime allowance at the last minute wasn't incremented. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, and we've got a question here. Um, it's for the veterans reclaim for 2021-22. Is it acceptable for the payroll software to allow the claim to be run via a previous year update and for the user to calculate this manually, enter the details in and submit? What HMRZ? Actually, if you can take that person's um, email address, um, I can send them the guidance from HMRC to software developers, if that's okay. Is, that's is fantastic. That okay? Yeah, yeah, if if yeah. Uh, if uh, the person that they, submitted that question saying, run every pay period, um, which is why I think it's much better to just jot it all down in a letter. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, that person has submitted their email address so that we can uh, send that over to them. Terrific. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, I have got another question um, and this is um, about the impact of the national minimum wage on mm. employers generally um, mm. and, you know, the issue of it causing a gap, um, a, a decreasing gap, I suppose, between those at the lowest wages and junior and middle management. What, what are your views on that? Oh, no, I, I think absolutely. And, and, and this might apply for, for, for your likes of your, 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 your big retail stores where you've got, you know, your, your, your people sort of like uh, hanging the knickers on uh, or putting the knickers on a shelf might be paid at just above the national minimum wage, but their supervisor is paid a little bit, a little bit more. And then the manager's obviously paid a, a lot more than that. Well, if the people um, uh, stuffing the knickers and, and, and hanging up the blouses, their wages go up by 6.6%, I think your supervisors would possibly expect their wages to increase by 6.6% uh, to maintain that difference between your, your uh, person that hangs up the blouses and the person that tells the person to hang the blouses up. I think that is a real issue. Yes, I absolutely think that is a real issue. But I'm sure it's an issue every year, to be quite honest, for employers, definitely in retail and you know, super, supermarkets and, 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 and leisure and that kind of I'm sure it's an issue every year. But this year, the increase is so substantial that I think it will be. I think it will be an issue. 
And, you know, with the national minimum wage as well, you've got employers all over the place saying, I can't afford it. Because um, the, the poor employers, and I totally understand it, employers are looking, uh, we're not really, they talk about post-pandemic and post-COVID, so we're not that, we're, we're, we're hopefully, but employers are looking at survival and they're looking at their costs. I think employers are not going to welcome it, really. It's good for workers. Good for workers, no doubt it's good for workers, but I think it's, it's a struggle for employers, especially with the increased national insurance um, next, next year. It's, it's, a, it's a worry. Okay, um, now uh, thinking about compliance that you have obviously said um, that HMRC are going to be looking at kind of repeatedly, they've obviously got their, their eye on the ball. Um, I wondered if you wanted to say anything about the payroll KPIs that you have worked on with the um, with the profession and the upcoming training. Oh no, I mean that that'll be that will be really interesting. So yes, uh, uh, I, I realised together with the profession we put together this strategic KPI uh, model, and so so we came up with a suggestion. We put it to the profession. We got this working group together, and they said, "Oh God, no, that's rubbish." And oh yeah, I like that. But what about this? And what about that? So it was adapted. So it was presented um, in um, uh, National Payroll Week. Now you've got this model that's out there. So the white paper is on the I Realise website. But now we've got employers come into us and say, well, how do I how do I actually work with that model um, and how do I implement it at, at, at my workplace? How do I adapt it to my workplace? Because the flexibility of the model is that maybe you don't want to measure all of those things at your particular workplace. So the, the, the beauty of it is, is well, you can just take one of those sections out and, uh, uh, and, and just measure the ones that are specific. So, yes, we've got training coming up. And I don't know if it's advertised, is it, um, on the website? Um, yes, there is um, an area of the website where we're advertising this. Um, but the, the spaces are very, very limited. So I suggest that people register as soon as possible. What we will do is include a link to that when we mail out the slides to everybody. Yeah, no, I think that would be really good. And, uh, and the reason that the spaces are limited is um, and, and, and it's great that people are, uh, are taking up the opportunity for, uh, to, uh, to uh, undertake this training so that they've got a KPI model at their, at their workplace. But another reason for that is because we didn't want a classroom filled with 10, uh, 10 or so people uh, because you can't bespoke a KPI model when you've got uh, 10 different people from 10, 10 different organizations. So we're keeping the numbers down on the training session so that we can work more with each of the organizations. So well, what is applicable at your organization? Ooh, I th oh, I, th I think you might be wrong there. You know, maybe consider this, maybe consider that. Um, uh, and that's why the spaces are limited. So have I have I answered the question? I, I think I think you have very thoroughly, Ian, have as I? always, as I would only expect and everybody else uh, who's listening would expect. Um, I don't have any more questions for the moment, but what there is left for me to say is that you will obviously, everyone that's here will be uh, very welcome to join our next and I think final uh, payroll and reward brunch of the year on Thursday the 25th of November at 11 a.m um when we'd love to see you um so I well, will you know, be that makes me look a real else. plonker Claude because what's I'm this then right here I've said it's on the 2nd of December <laughs> well you actually you know what you may well be right and I may well be wrong um <laughs> but um we'll say what the 2nd I? of December I will let people know the correct date I will just check my slides then. But what I'm looking to do then is sort of like um, uh, review the payroll year. Um, and I think it's going to it's been a it's been a horrible year. But, you know, we, we, we've got to look forward. So I think it's good to sort of like review what happened, um, what the the emphasis for for employers should be going forward. And um, oh, enjoy some mince pies. Oh, without doubt. I mean, the mince pies are already in the shops and <laughs> the Christmas songs are playing. And we haven't um, even had Halloween yet. And we haven't. No, no. It gets earlier every year. 
Let's be but honest. I've got my turkey. I've got my panic bought my turkey. My goodness, you're prepared. So even if we bought Christmas forward to next week, you'd be on it, Ian. I'll be there. Yeah, as long as I can defrost it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, look, um, I think all that remains is to say thank you to everyone for attending. Um, thank and you. And we hope to see you again in November, December. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ian. Bye. Okay.